Hey everybody, welcome to a brief introduction to Julia. In this video, I'll be going over the history of the Julia language. I'll then move on to discussing the features that make Julia a great language. And we'll go into a bit more detail on Julia's standout features, the things that really make Julia such a great language. We'll then do a code demo where I'll be solving one of the exercises on the Julia track. And we'll finish off with listing the resources that you can use to learn Julia. I'm excited about Julia and I hope you are too. So let's get started. The first version of Julia was designed and developed by Jeff Bezanson, Stefan Karpinski, Vyra Bishaw, and Alan Adaman. At the time, they were building software to help them with scientific computing. And they found that when they did so, there was not one language that suited all their needs. So whenever they had to build software, trade-offs had to be made. And they thought, well, why don't we develop our own language and we'll just pick the best parts of all the languages that we like, and then we'll mix and match that. And we have one language that suits all our needs. So their goal was to have a language that is free and high level, and that has the speed of C, the dynamism of Ruby, the general purpose skills of Python, the metaprogramming of a Lisp, the string processing power of Perl, the uh, linear algebra support of MATLAB, and the statistic support of R. And all these features should be working well in uh, massively parallel situations too. Uh, and that was the goal they set out to um, with Julia and Julia became that language. Julia is a multi-paradigm language, which means that it supports different styles of programming. Um, you can use imperative programming in Julia and you can use functional programming with higher order functions and partial application. And you can also use object-oriented programming in Julia. There is a difference from regular uh, object-oriented languages, and we'll come back to that later on while we'll be discussing Julia's standout features. Julia is dynamically typed, uh, similar to a Python and a Ruby, and it's compiled just in time. So the Julia team actually referred to this as uh, a just-in-time ahead-of-time compiler. And this means uh, in practice that when you run Julia code, the very first time that a function is executed, the Julia compiler will analyze the Julia code and generate machine code for it. Only when the function is executed does this compilation step happen. So this is the just-in-time part. And the ahead-of-time part is, well, before the function is executed, it has to be compiled. So it has to be compiled ahead of time. Julia is, of course, excellent for scientific computing, but it was also designed as a general purpose language. And you can see that, for example, in the Genie framework, which allows you to build web apps with Julia. Julia is fully open source. This has resulted in over a thousand contributors helping improve the language. And then this, this open approach has also fostered a community of friendly and helpful people all welcoming new Julia enthusiasts in their community. Finally, the places where Julia is being used already is quite amazing. So for example, there is the Celeste project, and this is a project where uh, 178 terabytes of astronomical data is being analyzed, and they use Julia for that. So Julia runs on a, on a supercomputer, massively parallel execution. And um, a fun fact to mention is that Julia became the first dynamic language to join the Petaflop club, which are languages that uh, were being used to uh, calculate uh, a quadrillion floating point calculations in a second. And that's a one with 15 zeros. And at the time that club was very exclusive. It was just C, C++ and Fortran. And Julia was the first dynamic language to make it to that club. So quite a feat. A second place where Julia is being used is in CLIMA, which is the Climate Modeling Alliance, which is a group of people from Caltech, MIT and NASA's Jet Propulsion Labor Laboratory. And they are developing a new climate forecast model, and it's all being done in Julia. Um, other places where Julia is being used is CERN and ASML, well known of their chipset factories. And uh, there's also several banking places where Julia is being used. So it's being used in a wide variety of places and with really big applications. Let's go into the reasons why Julia is a great language. First of all, it is great for scientific computing, data mining, machine learning. Linear algebra and distributed computing. If you are working in a domain that has any of these use cases, Julia is an excellent choice. Um, Julia is also an excellent choice if you are using 
uh, mathematical equations to in your code uh, because its notation will feel very similar to the mathematical equations. So the process of converting a mathematical equation to Julia code is relatively easy. The second great feature is that Julia's dynamic nature and REPL make it a very interactive language. The REPL is a, an application, a console application, where you can quickly try out new things. You can run any Julia code and see its results printed on the screen. And uh, combining this with Julia's dynamic nature makes this an excellent option if you quickly want to try out things without getting to be bogged down with all the different types, etc. So it's, it's great for exploring new things. Julia's third great feature is its metaprogramming support. With metaprogram, you can write code to generate or transform code. And Julia implements this in a way that is very reminiscent of uh, a Lisp language, where the thing that you receive that describes the code is encoded in actual Julia types that you are already familiar with. So the process of analyzing code uh, is quite easy in Julia because you will reuse everything that you already know about Julia. Um, the macros are especially powerful. So macros are a way of doing metaprogramming in Julia. And there's a wide variety in which you can use them. You can introspect so you can see what the macros will actually generate. But uh, all in all, metaprogramming in Julia is very powerful. And it can be used as a way to extend the language without actually building things into the language. The last great feature I'd like to mention is that Julia code interrupts really well with C and Fortran code. If you want to use code that is written in C or Fortran, that is very easy to do. Uh, what's interesting though, is that Julia offers an interrupt with other languages too via libraries. So there are libraries to interrupt with Python, C++, R and MATLAB. So if you want to use any of the code that was written in those languages, you can interrupt with those via libraries. Uh, and that means that you basically get a ton of different software that you can work with from Julia in a relatively painless way. And you don't have to re-implement it yourself, just use what's already there. Let's discuss Julia's standout features. First of all, multiple dispatch. With multiple dispatch, the types of functions arguments are determining which function to call. So you can do function overloading in Julia, but it is all the arguments types that determine which function to call. And this is different to, for example, an object oriented language where usually the uh, the first argument, which is the object that the method is being called on, determines the function to call the method. Uh, but with Julia, with multiple dispatch, all the types of all the arguments determine which function to call. And this is actually incredibly powerful. So um, in an object oriented language, it is easy to define a new type uh, and have it work with existing methods, existing operations. So this is easy in object-oriented languages, but it's hard in functional languages. However, in functional languages, it is easy to define new functions slash operations that work on existing types, but that is hard in object-oriented languages. But with multiple dispatch, both these use cases become uh, incredibly easy. So you get them both for free. And um, it might take a little time to uh, really appreciate how powerful multiple dispatch is, but once you've done it, uh, there is no going back. Multiple dispatch is awesome and really, really recommend you trying that, uh, this out. The second standard feature of Julia is that even though it is a dynamic language, it has great performance. The performance of Julia code can often rival that of Fortran and C, which are well known for being very high performance languages. And Julia, you get this high performance, even though you still get all the benefits of being a dynamic language. So the expressiveness, the, the flexibility, um, but you still get all the benefits of being very performant. Um, one of the interesting aspects about this is that normal code in Julia is often very performant code. So you usually don't require re weird hacks like maybe putting everything in a single function to save on function overhead or um, to have a un loop unrolling or whatever. There's a lot of different ways in which you uh, have to structure your code in other languages just to be able to get high performing code. But in Julia, most normal code is already very performant, which is great. Um, there are also things that are not built into the language, but are built into libraries that make Julia great. For example, there are libraries that seamlessly allow you to run code on the GPU. 
And this can be very, very beneficial for performance too. But all in all, um, Julia is a language that is great for performance and you get all the benefits of it being dynamic too. The last standard feature I'd like to mention is that Julia is fantastic for distributed computing. If you want to have code run on different machines or on the same machine, but in parallel, it is very easy to do so. Julia has a lot of features that help you with that. For example, it has tasks, which are like coroutines and channels, and they allow you to run something on your machine, but in parallel, and they can communicate with each other via channels in a safe way. Um, it is very easy to write code that is running in parallel. But Julia is also great for running things over multiple processes. So for example, I mentioned that Julia runs on supercomputers and they will run millions of threads. And Julia is fantastic for running in these situations because it has great multi-process support. It has message passing. And this makes Julia an excellent language if you want to do distributed computing. Let's look at some Julia code. I will be solving the difference of squares exercise, which consists of three different tasks. The first one is that we need to calculate the square of the sum of the first n natural numbers. So uh, in this case, n is 10 in this example. So you get one plus two plus three, etc., up until 10. And then we need to square the result of that summation. So the summation is uh, 55 and then squaring that gives us 3025. The second task is to sum the squares of those natural numbers. So you get one squared plus two squared plus three squared up until n squared, in this case, 10 squared, and that is 385. And uh, the last part is to get the difference between the first part and the second part. So that's the exercise that we will be solving. I am using Visual Studio Code with this plugin, the official Julia language support plugin. And this gives us a lot of goodness, including syntax highlighting, but also some nice documentation uh, support, etc. So let's get started. This is our starting point. So we have three functions that we need to implement, square of sum, sum of squares and difference. They all take a single argument called n, and they all have this string before them, directly before them, which is a doc string. So this is documentation for that function. So we're gonna start out implementing the square of sum function and we'll do this in a very naive way. We'll um, refactor it later on. So what we do is we'll have a sum variable. We'll have an i that starts with one. So this will be uh, our range indicator. So while i is less than or equal to uh, n, so this will be one up until n and of course, we will need to increment the i. So this will range over all the numbers up until n, starting from one, and we'll need to update the sum. So sum will add i to it. So first sum will be, we'll add one, then we'll add two, three, etc., until n. And then the n, we need to return a square. So we'll do sum times sum. And we don't need to do a return keyword. You, we can use the return keyword, but in Julia, the last expression is always returned. So uh, this is more idiomatic. So just the last value is the expression is this. So that's what gets returned. Let's run our tests. And we get some passing tests and a lot of failing tests. Uh, so that's good. We do have some passing tests. So we're now going to copy paste this bit of code into the sum squares function. And this is basically almost the same code, except for instead of adding i to the sum, we're adding it square. And in the end, we don't know, no longer need to square because we already added the square here. So we're gonna run this again and we get more passing tests. Now we just have the difference function to implement. So we do um, uh, subtract, the, subtract the sum of squares from square of the sum. So uh, square of sum, oh, square of sum, you see nice syntax highlighting and code suggestions, min minus sum of squares, run it again, and we have everything passing. So we now have fully working code. It's fairly imperative. It is probably easy to understand. Um, it will perform well, but there is a, a lot of stuff that we can do to make this nicer. In particular, what I want like to do is to get rid of this 
uh, this ranging bit of code. So um, it is a very common use case to have a range of numbers. And there's a thing that's called a range in Julia. And a range is a starts with a number, ends with a number, and it represents every number from up until, from the first lower bound up until the higher bound. So our range would be one up until n. So, um, okay, so that's good. So how do we then sum that? So we can, we can do a couple of things. So let's start out with a version where we not, no longer have the, the i bit, but we're gonna do for i in the range one up until n, and, and then we'll do sum. So get rid of this. So we got rid of the while loop and we got rid of the i variable. And instead we are here, we are iterating over the range of one up until n. So that's the one colon n and then uh, summing it. So let's run this again, still all passes. So we can do the same thing here. We can remove the i, do this, remove the i here, run it again and we still get everything working. So this is our third refactoring, already a bit nicer. We're using the fact that Julia has a concept of ranges and a uh, code is already becoming prettier. Let's simplify this even more by using some of the built-in functions in Julia. So obviously summing over a range is something that is done a lot. So um, instead of having this for range summy thing, we can call the sum function. And that takes a lot of different things, but one of the things that it can take is a range. So that's what we want. And then we'll rename this to sum of n just to make it a bit more clear. And this should still be the same thing. And it is passing. So that's good. So we've simplified this a bit. Second thing that we can do is we can, this squaring is something that is quite common. So uh, squaring is also built into Julia with an operator. So instead of doing this, we're gonna remove this and we're gonna do hat two. So that's squaring, run it again. And now you can see this is almost like, if you squint a little bit, it's very akin to a uh, mathematical equation where you use summation and squaring. So this is quite a neat and concise way of doing this. Unfortunately, we can't really apply that uh, entirely here because we don't just sum uh, a range, but we sum over the squares of that range. So we need to do something better here. And there's a couple of ways in which we can do that. So um, as a first step, I'm gonna uh, copy this bit here. So we're gonna try and work with this. Um, but what we can do is there's a uh, overload of this uh, sum function that transforms the, the value that gets passed into it. So for that, we can um, pass in as the first argument, a function that applies a transformation. So we're gonna say square. And then as the second thing, the, the thing that's being iterated over. So that's our range. So let's run this and see if this works. Um, and it almost works because there's an edge case where it doesn't work for the empty sequence. So zero. So. Uh, what we can do instead is we can, if you start with zero, the sum will be the same because for zero, zero squared is still zero. So it doesn't influence the sum, but we no longer have an empty uh, range being iterated over and it's now all fine. So this is a, a nice way where you can see that we're now using function overloading because we're using the same function, but with different, ver uh, different arguments. So. This is an example of multiple dispatch being very useful to us. As a final refactoring, we can replace these uh, iterating over ranges with math. So um, the sum of the first n positive integers is actually, there's a formula for that. So the formula is the Gauss sum and it's defined by n squared plus n divided by two. So let's see if we can get that to work. So n squared plus n and then we'll divide that by two and then that result we need to square so that should be the same thing and let's run it only it isn't so it says um, 
expected integer but good value of type float. And this is because the division operator gives us a float. Uh, there is another operator that we can use for uh, integers. And we'll showcase another interesting thing of Julia is that it has support for Unicode symbols and identifiers. So um, if you have ever uh, seen uh, mathematical papers, the styling will be later. And uh, later uses a lot of different uh, mathematical symbols in it. And you can use those same symbols in Julia code. So I'm going to do backslash div and then do tab and then replace it with this symbol. So you don't need to remember how to write that. Just do backslash div tab and most editors will have support for this. And this is the integer division operator. So if you've ever written later, this will be familiar to you. If you haven't, um, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but you get nice, a uh, very mathy, uh, very mathy code. So we get this now, so that actually works. Uh, and we can do the same thing with the sum of squares, because actually there's a square pyramidal number. So it's n times n plus two times two n plus one divided by six. So, okay, n times n plus one times two n my plus one okay and then the end that needs to be divided by six so we're going to do integer division again run it oh and apparently i made a small mistake so um oh i need to i, I should have added this just parentheses okay and now we have implemented the second mathematical formula and this is a different way of doing difference of squares, but it showcases how nicely you can work with mathematical equations in Julia. Let's go over some of the resources that you can use to learn Julia. First of all, you can learn Julia on Exorcism, on the Julia track. The Julia track has over 50 exercises. And what's really interesting about the Julia track is that for uh, a lot of exercises, you will have a dig deeper tab once you've solved the exercise. And this dig deeper tab goes into detail on the different ways in which you can solve the exercise. So if you solve an exercise, go check out if there's a dig deeper tab and see if there's maybe an approach there that you uh, could try out yourself because there's a lot of different ways in which you can solve things. And these approaches go into the different ways that you can do so. Apart from the Julia track, you can of course uh, use the Julia documentation. It is nicely uh, split up. It is very readable. A lot of examples. Uh, there's a manual. There's some base uh, stuff on going on sorts of high level topics. Um, but there's also the standard library there. There's everything that you can use uh, to write your code. And it's all great. And uh, I would highly recommend you uh, having a browse through the official documentation. The official docs also have a style guide, which means that it is guidance on how you should be writing idiomatic Julia code. Uh, a lot of stuff here. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but if you want to learn how to write Julia in an idiomatic way, this style guide document is highly recommended. Um, Julia performance is of course great. Um, so there are just a couple of tips here that you can use to make it even better. And um, I found this, for example, very fun that performance critical code should be inside a function. And that's uh, very contrary to how you would maybe do it in other languages where Julia encourages you to write these smaller functions. But there's a lot of uh, cool stuff here that you can use to eke out even more performance from your already great performance language. The juliablogger.com website is an aggregator for Julia blogs. So a lot of different posts here. Uh, there will be something there for everybody. Highly recommend you trying that out. Um, the Julia Lang's discourse is the forum where you can uh, chat with other people in the community, ask questions, uh, maybe uh, read up on the latest developments in Julia. So this is a great resource if you want to um, become part of the Julia community. If you want to learn about uh, the reasons why Julia was created, there is an, uh, a blog post from 2012. And uh, in this blog post, they go into detail on why they built Julia and what their reasoning was about it, etc. Uh, but interestingly, 10 years after this document, they released a new version of why we use Julia. So this is uh, a lot of people and, and these people all use Julia for a wide variety of reasons. And it's a collection of interviews and you can see how Julia is being used uh, 
in the real world uh, and why. So it is really interesting. If you want to learn um, Julia from videos, there is a very nice video uh, that is part of JuliaCon 2019 and is called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Multiple Dispatch. And multiple dispatch is maybe the killer feature of Julia. It's at least one of its uh, best features. In this video, uh, the Stefan Karpinski gives a really nice introduction into why multiple dispatch is such a great feature. Uh, with some really good examples. So I would highly recommend you uh, checking out this video. And then this is part of the official Julia programming language uh, YouTube channel, which contains every single Julia Khan uh, video uh, from the very, very first iteration. So there's a ton of stuff here. Um, there should be something for everybody here. Uh, so if you wanna see some videos and learn some Julia, the Julia language official channel is a great way to do that. And with that, we've reached the end of this video. I hope this introduction to Julia has been useful to you and that you're now keen on trying out some Julia code for yourselves. If you are doing that, please let me know in the comments what you think. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts and see you next time. Bye.